Oh, we're on, uh, let's do the Armada. I'll give you a map, do a few other wars. Sound good? Don't like to brag. Look at this. Yeah, I love maps. Look at all my stuff with my bare hands for you. Just a second. I know you want to see a picture, so let me show you a picture real fast. I'm looking for this. I'll show you this. I showed you this last year. Maybe it was history. What that is, don't you? I feel like <laughs> Is that McDonald's chicken nuggets? Those are chicken McNuggets, yes! Doesn't it kind of look like strawberry ice cream? Yes. They, they, they actually they look a little different now because they have such bad press for that. Yeah, I remember that. But yeah, those are McNuggets. I mean, McNuggets are just chicken hot dogs. They're not necessarily good or bad. Uh, but humans like fatty, deep fat fried meat products. <laughs> Does anyone here like McNuggets? I gotta be honest, I, I haven't had the McNugget in. But I used to eat them all. <laughs> Got to admit. Uh, okay, so uh, a little bit of war, religious war. I'll give you time to work on the map. Sound good? And we will have a quiz on 14.1 and I said 14.1 and 14.2, so I changed it a little bit. So I will drop that quiz quiz Thursday, but you can do it on Friday too. Sound good? Just a little reading quiz, and you already have the bookmark for that. And we are going to start then. Then that goes to 30 Years War, and then we'll go to English Civil War. And then um, uh, Galileo. They're quite a jump into the scientific revolution. And then we have more war. And then guess what? More war. This is a lot of, there's a lot of war going on here. So we already mentioned Drake and the privateers. Uh, the big thing about the Netherlands and that perpetual fight in the Netherlands where eventually become the United Provinces. And I wish my map. We're getting closer when my map starts to work. So I got this map and the other European history map on the top, AP Euro. And AP Euro starts with the right side. So I wish I had it wrong. But it's still basically, this is the empire of a pretty weak right end. But that perpetual fight of Spain trying to control Elizabeth jumping in. We talked about Mary Queen of Scots and that whole, all that intrigue where she was finally beheaded. So we're coming to the Spanish Armada. And so I don't need to say it again, but Mary Queen Scots, we know, Philip was furious about this. So here's another even gruesomer picture of her being beheaded. And by the way, what did she wear? Yeah. And red. Oh, by the way, they didn't paint her red here because they didn't want to, um, didn't want to give her credit for that. Yeah, but, and then once Spain, once Britain heard that Spain was about to attack, Francis Drake, who literally just arrived back from his trip around the world, he did a shocking attack on the Spanish harbor of Cadiz right here, where they surprised the Spanish fleet that was organizing in 1587, destroying a significant number of them, but totally disrupting their plans for over a year. This Drake attack cannot be understated because the Spanish might have had as many as 54 ships, even though it still would have been really hard for them to take Britain. In fact, it's almost impossible to imagine them doing it. They at least would have a chance. But with this, Spain should have just called her off. They were not going to have enough ships. They were about 130 total. Many of them were galleys, and galleys still had the men rolling them. And trying to roll on the Atlantic Ocean would be an absolute disaster. And they didn't have the Latin, a lot of them didn't have the Latin sails. That was a, it was more of a Mediterranean fleet. So it really was not a good fleet for Atlantic activity. 
And Elizabeth, realizing the state of that threat, she would begin something that later on we would call realpolitik or politique. And that is political action that's best for the state. In this context, it's not going to be the religion, it's going to be the state that will matter. Wow, I'm recording, everything's cool, yes. So, here's a very dramatic picture of Elizabeth rallying the troops. And I like this painting, but you'll notice they're, they're, they're like armored knights from 300 years earlier. This is not the way they're dressing by then. Yes, they would have, they still wore breastplates, and they might wear something over their shoulder, and they wore a helmet, but they were not the fully armored knights. As weapons changed, they became too slow, too unwieldy, too expensive. <laughs> and so she rallied the soldiers and rallied the state to defend the state. And even though she used also as an example, they want to destroy our religion, she made moves based upon whatever took, for example, in the short run, she would ally herself with France because France and Spain had been fighting. So she would use whatever it took. And Britain and France were like perpetual enemies. And so here's how it works. You, just, you don't need to write all this down. I'm just going to give you an example. Here's a Spanish plan. So up here in the Netherlands, here is uh, here's the Duke of Alba and Parma, now the Duke of Parma. He's up here. He has these trained soldiers in the Netherlands right here. They're up there, ready to go. And so they would go to the coast. And wait, so you don't need to know this. I'm just kind of giving you an idea what happened. And then the over 130 ships. And by the way, Santa Cruz, experienced commander, but most of his fighting was in the Mediterranean. A lot different than the rough Atlantic Sea. And the North Sea is incredibly rough. And they would sail from Cadiz to here, little town of Calais, which is 19 miles. Pick up those soldiers, jump across, invade England. And the thought was with those experienced soldiers, Britain would not have a chance. And there, straight to Dover, boom. And they were constructing these just flat bottom barges that they would row. Terrible for rough seas, but you can pack a bunch of men off. But flat bottom means every wave just tosses like that. If you ever look at a sailing vessel, any vessel to have a really long keel, and that keeps them aligned. It's actually amazing how the the keel on some of those sailboats, modern sailboats, weigh as much as the rest of the boat combined. But they can't sink. I mean, they go like this into the water and pop back. Pretty amazing. But not then. And then the assumption was all the Catholics would rise up and overthrow Elizabeth. So that's the point. And they're hoping maybe they could get the Scots to join in, but that was fantasy because by then John Knox had become such a powerful figure. They were pretty Calvin. So that was the plan. So, just so we get it in a nutshell, invade, go here, get troops, invade. So let's see what happens. Just a couple of things happen. It's such a good story. So they start here and sail here, really rough seas. And Britain knew. So you see this finger of land here? All along, they sent these little, there's these little warning outposts. And they see the ships, they're supposed to light a lantern. And it would be like wildfire going. They light a lantern here and go all the way down the coast. So they could actually know if the ship was here, they would know in London in less than an hour, which is pretty remarkable considering it's 1588. And please do the right picture. Oh, right here. They call them Beacon States. You don't even know that. I just want to show you the Beacon State. But they're still there. And you can go uh, look at them. They're, you don't want to go in. People use them for various things. We'll leave it at that. But right before they're ready to take off, Santa Cruz, who's going to command this, experienced commander, he died. The Duke of Medina was not really a naval commander at all, but he was given command. And so this was already, the expedition was in trouble. Philip was so determined, though, in the righteousness of his way, but also he was just, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do this. And so this is a really bad start. And there's something else here. I just put down Plymouth. This is Plymouth Harbor. Let's go back one. This is right here. Plymouth is right here. And so that's where the British focus most of their ships. And what? Right here, Plymouth. Is that on um, 
Where is that at? This is England. Oh, okay. Right there. Cornwall. And it's still, it's like the biggest, it's um, like the traditional Royal Navy naval base. And if you go there, they still have, they still have a couple models of the ships that were used at this time, remakes. And they still have a ship there that's still the original ship that was used in the Napoleonic Wars. The victory is still here. I should add one more thing. In World War I, this was way too vulnerable. So they took all the Royal Navy and put them way up here in the miserable place called Scapa Flow, but they could be out of the way. I don't know why I had to tell you, but I had to tell you. So let's go back to this. So the thing about it was, is that the British ships were faster. The British ships were also had longer range cannon because they were used to fighting on the Atlantic. They also had Dutch allies from the United Provinces who were faster ships. The Spanish ships were slow. Many were still row, used by um, used for rowing. They didn't have as advanced sails. So the British knew they had this great advantage in speed. Most of the ships were um, smaller, but they had longer range guns. And the two commanders, here's the commander of the fleet, Charles Howard, but Sir Francis Drake would be the same guy did at Cadiz. He would have a great influence on the battle plan be one of the heroes. So Drake really is one of the heroes of this fight. Howard and Drake. And so they know the large Spanish fleet, if they could disrupt their timetable and pick it up the troops at Calais, the Spanish fleet would be in real trouble. Ironically, that warning system failed and the Spanish were able to slip by. There are a couple of minor fights, but slip by the main British fleet and get to Calais. It almost worked. Now Calais, in, now it's in France. It's right here. Tiny little harbor, which is 19 miles across to Dover and England. So if you're standing here, you can see England or vice versa. And there's always a story of uh, in Spanish, they could see it but couldn't get there. So like uh, 200, 220 years later, Napoleon looking across, couldn't get there. Or in 1939, Hitler couldn't get there. And there will be a couple battles, but at Calais, the, the, uh, the Spanish ships arrived, ready to pick up the Duke of Alba, the Duke of Parma, to pick up his horses. And two things happened. Those flat bottom boats that were going to take them weren't there. And most of the Spanish soldiers were still 20 miles away. They didn't get the supplies. They weren't ready. They all they had a tiny window, but now they're stuck there at anchor. And the English and the Dutch ships are circling around looking for a way to attack. Boy, it's really snowing. We're supposed to get 20 to 30 feet of snow tonight. Actually, my little weather app. It's probably supposed to be sunny. I think it's supposed to slow to Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw it, it said something like that. I'll look at right now. It said 30% chance of snow. And it said uh, 0.20 inches of snow. But it looks like it's going to snow more than that. It's really coming down. But it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be in the like 49 by Sunday or Monday. So, I already mentioned Parmesan and the Netherlands, and the Royal Navy went out, and Elizabeth would give what's considered her greatest speech, rallying the English Navy as they left the harbor. And she, who had been educated in many different languages, but could speak the language of common sense, partially uh, when they were trying to kind of hide her and move her around so she wouldn't be beheaded by her half sister, sister Blood, Bloody Mary. She had the ability to communicate with regular sailors, with regular soldiers, and she gave this incredible speech. Just a sec. Are we still good here? Huh? 
and rallying the men to attack, rallying them to brave all the consequences. I'm here with you. A really gifted leader. And I like this picture showing her, this is supposed to be her speech. You see the ships in the background. But of course she's carrying her orb. Gotta have the orb. No, and she dressed, uh, she dressed almost like a man, like a sailor. You know, she, really clever politician. And the plan was this. Remember I mentioned those before, they, those fire ships, the Hellburn. They sent those into the Spanish ships at Calais. And the Spanish ships just totally freaked out. Because if the, you know, the ships catch fire, there's nothing they can do. It's done. Wooden ship. To, they use tar or pitch to try to seal leaks, and that stuff would just go off. Just poof. And so they scatter. And what happens when they scatter? Individual ships can be picked off by the Dutch and the English ships and devastating the fleet, giving the English a huge advantage. And so the stragglers had to leave Calais. They had to panically leave, so they couldn't organize their navy. And so they left. And here's the problem. The current goes this way. So they're like, well, we got to go this way. They had to leave Calais. And as they're leaving right here, they still haven't organized their line. They ran into the English and the Dutch who were organized. That, oh, the Ark Royal, you don't need to write that down. This is just um, Drake's ship. That's what it looked like. I, I just find the ships at that time, look how top heavy they are. The battle is called Greymonds. And Howard and Drake are waiting for them. And they had their ships aligned in such a way to suck the Spanish in. They had mine in a concave shape like this. And the Spanish were kind of disorganized in the middle. And by this concave shape, the Spanish, the individual Spanish ships either try to run away or they attack, and they just swung the arms around and overwhelmed them. A devastating victory, a decisive victory. And the Spanish Armada would be destroyed. Not completely. Because here's the grave lines right here. And the Spanish are now stuck here. They can't go back because the currents are so bad they'd have to move so slow that they'd be destroyed. So they had to go all the way around with off charts in the rugged North Sea on ships not designed for here and just hope they make it. And if they try to stop and get water or other provisions, you know, there's enemy population all the way around. Yeah. Is there any ship that you go in the North Sea? Because like when I was in there, like I didn't see any. I mean they can, you know, I mean modern ships, but it's so rugged. Yeah, that's what I thought when I was sitting there. It's really cold. And literally cold. And think about it, you know, like in um, in winter or fall even, the days are really short because, well, here's, so here's the 49th parallel of the border of the United States. So Helena would be about here, elevation wise. See how much further north? That's way up there. That's one of the things that surprised the English colonists when they arrived. When they got to Massachusetts, they just assumed, oh, it's, it's further south of Britain, it'll be really nice here. No, it's really cold. Blew them away. That could be shifting because of the Arctic line. But anyway, they had to go all the way around, and they did make it. But a couple storms, especially the Irish Sea, eventually over half of the ships would be destroyed. They would lose thousands of men, a disaster for Spain. Here is a picture. This is actually a picture. It's a big picture of Queen Elizabeth. But in the background, they show the Spanish fleet being destroyed. So that's the picture of her in the background. Yeah. Yeah. See, right here? So all you need to know is the Spanish fleet was destroyed. You don't need the exact numbers. But there, and so with that, a decisive British victory. So Britain would remain Protestant. And the important reason I put the Navy there is, this would show an island nation like England, the importance of the Navy. And, okay, they're gonna have civil war, other wars for, for 80 years. But the outcome of all of this will be that Britain will come up to the decision that we must have the most powerful Navy in the world. And this will be an important, decisive element of their of Great Britain. And 
Also, with this victory, they had the initiative to start creating their own empire. It's no coincidence that less than 20 years after the Spanish Armada, a British joint stock company called the London Company of Virginia would land right here at the James Peninsula and start a colony that they would name after her called Virginia. Because now they begin, we can do our own empire and copy the Spanish. Next, we tried here on Roanoke Island. We tried a colony here a couple years before the Armada. But because of the Armada, they couldn't go back and check on it for a few years. And when they came back after this victory, everybody was gone. The Spanish might have sailed out, killed. Or they could have done what a lot of settlers did. This is a terrible place. Let's go on uh, the interior trial. They call it interior trial. But that's, it's called Roanoke Island. So that's the English Civil War. And Philip II didn't last much longer than that. And eventually be replaced by Philip III. And the only reason I'm putting Philip III up is because you can see the Habsburg chin. And then, of course, Philip IV. And poor Philip IV could hardly eat solid food. His chin was so bad. His overbite was so bad that every time he would chew, it would cut his gums. I know. Oh. So what is this a lesson? Don't marry your cousin. Now, it's not like they quit fighting. They would actually, Philip II would try two more armadas, and both would fail. And Britain would try twice to attack, especially the Cadiz, same kind of thing. And one failed miserably, the other was more of a success. So it wasn't that uh, like Britain defeated Spain and Spain disappeared. Spain survived. Spain still was a mighty empire. They still would fight many wars, but they're on the decline. This would be Britain's on the rise. But last thing to put in for this, Elizabeth did not have an heir. She did not have an heir. We will come back to this, but ironically, her heir would be Mary Queen of Scots' son, James I. Kind of irony of ironies. And if you're wondering, I can't remember what James I looked like. Oh, are you going back to the creepy man, baby? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Like a what? Like a lifelike doll. I know. Yeah, one of those really creepy ones that. Yeah. A friend of mine in high school's mom collected dolls, and she had over 3,000 dolls. And some looked like that. That reminded me of that. And we would go into her house, and she had them all on like these little bench. You walk in on these little shelves, and you like, felt like you had like a thousand eyes staring at you. It was, the, so weird, like, it was creepy. <laughs> I wonder what happened to those. Let me show you one more thing. After Philip IV died, poor Carlos. I think the decline in the Habsburg bloodline of Spain coincided with the decline of the Spanish Empire. All right, so let's get to one thing really quick and then I'll give you time to work on the map. Sound good? And that's going to be we got more wars. You can never have enough wars, right? <laughs> the religious wars in France. France has their own. By the way, I'm not even sure how I got this color. Would you call that purple, violet? Lavender. Lavender? lavender? I think lavender is good, yeah. I like lavender. We're at this place where they had honey from bees who only were on lavender. And it was really good. Does it taste different? It's a little smell, like a little bit of lavender, you know? But it was really good. We thought it'd be kind of gimmicky. I wish we would have bought a lot of that. So remember the, the ballet family? The, the, they were the, the royal family of France. We had the, uh, the Habsburg Ballet Wars. 
with uh, Francis, Francois the first big nose. And this is nearing the end of its bloodline because of what's going to happen here. So let me get to this really quick, what happens here. So first off, after France, Francis the first died, big nose died, here's Henry the second. And he was a pretty powerful, one of, one of uh, a few powerful leaders in France at that time. They controlled the monarchy. They built the army. He made forceful decisions. So Henry the second, Following in his dad's footsteps. The problem was his dad kind of broke the bank, funding the war, and buying art and tape and tapestries and everything else. He made peace with Spain. How did he do it? His daughter Elizabeth married Philip II. Remember, Philip II was married to Mary. Mary died. Philip tried for a while to get Elizabeth to marry him, didn't happen, so Philip married Elizabeth. A good political marriage, but the thing about it was, Henry was a fighter, and he would joust. Oh, I should add, there was still religious conflict going on. We'll come back to that. Henry would joust. Now, we've mentioned jousting once before. Do you know what that is? Oh, before we get to jousting, let's get to this real fast. Huguenots first. The Huguenots were the Count French Calvinists. And the Bourbons who lived in this area right here, that was a royal family who were vassals to the king. Remember vassals from feudalism, but it's still a house of Bourbon. They were the leading Calvinist family. In fact, Henry of Navarre would be the, uh, the leading Bourbon. I know Navarre Bourbon. Just I wasn't there. I, tried, I should have made it simple. But there's Huguenots conflicts. Catholics versus Huguenots, Catholics versus Calvinists. We got the same fight. But at the wedding of Elizabeth and Philip, Henry wanted to show off his jousting skills. So <coughs> you drink water. So jousting would be nice in full armor. And this really was a very archaic way of fighting. And they'd have a, a ring set up. And then, um, if you look at that, there's a horse on the left hand side. And they carried a long spear, a jousting spear, thick, heavy wood that was designed to bend and then break if there's too much pressure for it to fail the horse, the rider. It had this barrier in between. So the two horses would ride full speed on your jousting set. And the idea was hopefully you could de horse the other man. That's when you jump. So you knock the, the, the other man off the horse. And you can have brutal injuries with this. And by the way, the jousting stick is shown here. They show it with a point. Normally they put a ball on it, so it wouldn't quite be as deadly. But these are still, this is an incredibly dangerous activity. Well, the king of France loved to joust. So he's jousting. He's coming this way, and he's jousting here. And it's hard to make out, but his joust slip. His competitor hit his chest armor, bounced out, bounced off whatever protection it had on there, and the point went right through his eye slit into his eye. And it must have went pretty deep. He died 10 days later. That's why Henry is crossed out. And he had four sons. One would die about 20 years after this, but they were basically weak kings. And so that would be the situation with, with France. You have a strong king holding it together. There's religious conflicts. He's making peace, and now you've got weak kings. And when you have weak kings, that means the other nobility would begin to take either try to drive out the Huguenots or the Huguenots to become more powerful. Yeah. What's exactly like, that made them a weak king? Like, what do they do that made them a weak king? Not decisive. Uh, not decisive, not, and not being able to rally other. Because a king wasn't quite, a king really didn't have the absolute power. So they had to convince other nobility to join them still. And so it became easier for like the Bourbons to say, nah, we're gonna do our own thing. Or powerful Catholic families like the Guise to get him to do what he wanted. I thought I had a picture here. Well, we're skipping right to here. Okay, so Henry the Second's, this is not right. Look back, try. Am I missing something here?
Okay, all right. Catherine de' Medici was, remember the uh, de' Medici family from Florence? She was uh, Henry's wife, so now widow. And so she was going to be the regent for actually two and have great influence over the third son. And the one of the most powerful families in France were the Guides, and they were very Catholic. And they had huge influence over de Met, uh, over Catherine de Medici. I want to call her Mary, because I have Catholic on my head. That's a picture of her near the end of her life. And actually, a lot of the nobility looked down on her because they were nobility, so they are of the land and this aristocratic birth. And she never made her money through through banking and that sort of thing. They called her a, uh, the shopkeeper, which was a major insult. It seems so weird now. So let's get to her kids. The first one, Francis II. He was only 15 years old, and he became the first king. And this, and remember him we mentioned before. He married Mary Queen of Scots, Mary Stuart. And this is the picture. That's the picture of him with the king. Does he look? I mean, he looks about 12. He looks 10. And these and that Catholic influence was huge, not only on Henry but on Mary. He was kind of a sickly child, and he got an ear infection. Oh, 17, Mary Queen of Scots was 17. Henry got an ear infection less than a year on the throne, and it killed him. So boom, gone. So now it goes into even a younger son. By the way, that's when Mary goes back, wants to get remarried, gets involved in all the intrigue. Yeah. Yeah. Hands are hard to draw, but he does look like he has freakishly big hands. That's like the palm of basketball. It looks bigger than his head. Yeah. And her hands look pretty big too. I think it really is just because hands are hard to draw. So I guess the bigger they are, they're easier to draw. Thus the portraits of the hand like that. And so, okay, I didn't notice the big hands. Now that's all I can see. <laughs> So next, 11-year-old Charles the Ninth. By the way, family resemblance, right? And he would be on the throne for, for 14 years, but he was sick the entire time, trying to have tuber tuberculosis. And there would be an increasing war between the Huguenots and the Catholics because of this. And yes, the Guise family was very, very influential on Catherine, therefore very influential on Charles. Here's Charles when he's a little bit older. And by the way, you know it's a painting they try to make him look a lot older. I just thought these two contrasts were pretty funny. Considering he was only on the throne for 14 years. So he was only 25 when he died. He looks 26. No, he looks he looks a lot older. But they came up with a plan. They came up with a plan to end the religious wars. Margaret of Valette, who was Charles' sister. Catherine's uh, uh, Henry II's son would marry the Bourbon Huguenot, Henry of Navarre. Henry of Navarre was the leading member of the Bourbon family, Henry of Navarre, and that would bring peace. And so here is a very creepy picture of Henry Navarre. And well, Margaret, by the way, that's Elizabeth's sister. Elizabeth was Mary Philip. He's a Protestant, he's a Calvinist. Oh, one more thing. This was very popular, and you see Louis XIV in this. Look at his mustache. they kind of like this scraggy thing, and they would go, and he'd start growing a mustache, and they would use tweezers and pick out hairs, which I, I'm just telling you, that would hurt so bad. But that was the style. Look how scraggly. I mean, it just looks like a, this just kind of get a dirty upper cheek. And then you see Louis the Fourteenth, Louis the Fifteenth, with that same strangly mustache. So, peace. Henry of Guise, though, the leading Catholic advisor, said, "No, we can't allow this. If we let Henry marry, the Huguenots will gain too much power. Let's use this as cover to attack." By the way, it looks like the sun's coming out. It's still snowing. 
That's what we call a monkey's wedding. And that's going to lead to what's called the St. Bartholomew's Day's Massacre. To celebrate the wedding, thousands of people came out that August 24, 1572. That was going to be peace. And what happened? Mobs of Catholics, along with the army, riled up by Henry of Guise, supported by Charles, would massacre at least 5,000 Parisian Huguenots and over 20,000 nationwide. Bodies were piled up by cordwood. They disemboweled and, and ripped them apart. They cut open, they cut pregnant women out, ripped out the, the baby. I mean, this was just this brutal, horrific murder. And this shows, you can see the massacre right here and the slashing of people, just unbelievable. Henry and Navarre, the only thing that saved him is he had to convert to Catholicism. So he went, he was Catholic, became a, became a Huguenot, have to become a Catholic again. Oh, he'll convert back. He, he's no dummy. He only convert five times. But this, remember I mentioned how this would have to get things going in the Netherlands. This would influence Elizabeth. This was a bloody fight. And Charles, because he was weak, was influenced by Henry of Guise. And that's where we end. Shoot, I was going to get a look. Here's a map. So, let's see what we got to tell See what you can write down right now. See what you can do. So, how? Don't forget how. Oh, By the way, this is the uh, supposed to be the best, one of the best maps, the Korean NK94 maps. So I'm trying it. It's pretty cool. Where's Austria? Huh? Where's Austria? That's where Austrians live. <laughs> it's most folks familiar. I know, I know. Okay, this one, I'm sorry about the map, doesn't have the border. So, Austria is just kind of a wall. Oh, okay. the, the borders were so vague, this map doesn't have it. So just kind of put a box approximately where they were. If you look at this map right here, here's Austria. Here's Hungary. Here's Bohemia. And this blog would change. Borders, as we know, were literally kind of the creation of the 18th century. Here they're very shifting and moving around. The most horrible war imaginable is coming up. The Thirty Years' War. Just awful. Imaginable to them at that time. Oh, we we have good imagination. We've got the World War One, World War Two. Mr. Partridge. Yes. Are we done for the day? No, I don't quit working. There's no off switch on me. Okay. Yeah, we're done. Okay. Have a good day. See ya. Where should I put the map? I think I'm going to hang around. I'm going to move the Berlin post. It is pretty cool. I know, I guess that's a good spot. I'm not to move, but i got to find a good place for Berlin. But that is really cool. It's right when the wall came down. I can still. That was such a big deal. I still. I can't even describe it. Put the Berlin one back. You don't have to do that. Or back on it. I might move it there. Uh, I might take these down. Okay. Oh, it's not a good place to go. I've got to put the Italian flag. Yeah, that's that cool. Where'd you get the flag at? Alex is an exchange student for the Eastern System. He actually made a lot of this. This is just cool. Yeah, the Italian flag now doesn't have the thing in the middle. So, by the way, you'll notice it's a copy of the French flag. Everybody yeah. copied. Yeah, I don't know if that's That's really nice. Yeah, that was really nice. But he's also doing it. I'm Italian. Where's my Italian flag? <laughs> Good point. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. There was an exchange student from Wales probably five years ago. And not, I, didn't have, I didn't have her in class. But uh, she came in one day because she was friends with people in 
my other boss and said, uh, and the Welsh accent was kind of why I can't do it. But she said, I heard you have a flag of Wales. And so she was so happy to see the dragon. Just so happy. And I was like, I love Wales. I tell people I'm Welsh, she was all not. <laughs> Is the accent really different? Hmm? Is the accent It's just a little different. It, it's, you can pick out a difference, yeah. But it, it, it it's different. I friends with the Scottish accent, and that's definitely. <laughs> and every everybody I've I've known from Scotland, regardless of the race, swears all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Normal conversational. <laughs> it's really funny. Kind of shocking. You just get used to it. All right. So the quiz, I mean, it won't be that big a deal. I'm not going to take questions. I'm not going to take questions. But we don't have a, we keep on thinking tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday. And then in less than a month, we'll be in here full time. In a way, I'm really glad. In a way, I'm, I'm worried. But just, right? How many people are in the class um, with like everybody? Well, we got about six or seven that are doing a lot. Of that. Okay. And then another four. And so I think it's like 13 or 14. It's not a very big class. So we might only have like eight or nine. Yeah, still. Which is. It's, 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 